I'm on? Great. Thank you, Sabah. Thank you, Treatment Advocacy Center. Thank you, everyone, for coming here today. And uh, you've all made relatively long journeys of one way or another to make it here. And today we're about to hear of another type of relatively long journey that uh, it's similarly, similarly to the one that I was on. Who? Uh, so very quickly, this is not about me, this is about them. But for those who don't know me, I graduated from assisted outpatient treatment right here in San Antonio. Thanks to this man and his treatment team right here, the Honorable Judge Oscar Kazin. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I have the pleasure of being here with someone who I've come to know very well over the past uh, year, Bradley Tarr. And similarly to me, he was also in assisted outpatient treatment, helped turn his life around. And we're also here with the Pre Taylor, who is a member of his uh, AOT treatment team. So we are all very, very lucky here uh, today to be able to hear from both of them. So, uh, Bradley, if you could, could you please just let us know a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, from, I grew up in uh, the Clear Fork Valley in Ohio, and uh, I'm currently 29 years old. I entered AOT when I was 26. Um, I've had schizoaffective symptoms since I was 11, um, and I probably own more Bibles than is actually healthy. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's fascinating. We'll get back to that because there are folks who hit just these extended rough patches due to SMI, uh, brain disorders, uh, whatever terminology we want to use, and it tests their faith to the point that they lose it. And not only did you keep your faith, but I believe it's stronger than ever. I, I, I not only uh, delve deeper, much, much deeper, like reading papal encyclicals type of deeper, but in, into my Catholic faith, but I bought like several like Qurans and like Bhagavad Gita, Dhammapada. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a book of Mormon. Like I'm, not only do I learn more every day about my own faith, but the other faiths of the world so that I can dialogue with others. That's beautiful. Thank you. Dupree, if you could, could you let us know a little about yourself, please? Uh, yeah, my name is Dupree, and uh, I've been working. Uh, my name is Dupree. I've been working uh, doing mental health for 13 years. Um, I started working in residential with children, and then I kind of graduated my way up to, to working with adults. Thank you so much, Dupree. So, Bradley, we know you are a success story. We know that's why you're here. Uh, if you could, could you please give the audience here today and everyone who's going to be watching this at a later time yeah. just a general understanding of what life was like prior to AOT? Yeah, prior to AOT, from the ages of approximately, it gets a little iffy when you've been in and out of a hospital and st that kind of stuff so many times, but I was in fourth grade, so I was around 11 years old when my symptoms first emerged. And I mean, I was through the gamut. And this often happens where people go through the gamut, they run the gauntlet of like, they don't know how to diagnose you at first. So at first they thought it was just chronic depression. And then when I went to middle school and high school, they thought that it was bipolar, bipolarism. Um, I forget whether it's type one or type two, but it's the one that, it's the type that's more prone to anger. Um, and then, uh, but then uh, when I went into AOT, like, from the ages of 11 to 26, I didn't have like an actual firm diagnosis. I remember there was a several times in high school when I was in and out of the hospital, a lot of times they would even put something like um, mood disorder spectrum or unspecified mood disorder. Um, but that's not me dogging on hospital psychiatrists. They do a lot to volunteer at hospitals and they're doing everything they can with the very limited time that they have. But yeah, I was in and out of the hospital from the age of 11 to 26 over 20 times, easy. Thank you for sharing. So, uh, you know, I actually went through something similar. I just want to bring this up to underscore the fact that this is not uncommon. When I was hospitalized prior to AOT, uh, what did I have? I, I had, depending on who, what professional you spoke to, I either had uh, anxiety, depression, psychosis, schizoaffective, bipolar disorder. And the thing is, is it, it's not like it was all of these different diagnoses born from incompetence. It's the fact that they can diagnose what they see. And sometimes I was very psychotic, sometimes not. 
So if you talk to my current psychiatrist who never saw me hospitalized, he'd say, well, bipolar disorder, and you might have had psychotic episodes or features with that. And uh, I actually recently had the pleasure of reconnecting with uh, the psychiatrist who saw me while I was hospitalized prior to AOT. And she was convinced at that time that it was schizoaffective disorder. But now uh, she said revisiting things that she's more confident that it's bipolar with psychosis. But I just want to let you all know that if you've got family members or people on your treatment teams who are trying to figure out what's the diagnosis, that's a great question. Hopefully, with the collaborative effort of the AOT treatment team, uh, you know, in this multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach, we can arrive at what actually is going on because we've got collaboration, really making things better for people with all of these different professions, all these different eyeballs on what's going on. And that's really a testament to the value of something like AOT. Yeah, I can speak to that too because, like, it wasn't just having a psychiatrist that saw me about once a month. It was also having um, a case manager slash liaison. Sometimes those terms can get kind of muddled together, but mm -hmm. um, but it was having a, a case manager that met with me once a week. It was having um, a counselor, you know, like a licensed, you know, master's degree level, you know, type counselor at, at the center that I, I met with, one, you know, once every couple of weeks. And it was even like seeing the judge once a week where the judge got to know me and I really got really close to, to judge Mayer. he just as you did with with your with your judge Oscar um, I mean he you know it wasn't just like a buy the book like oh I see you you give me a couple updates bada bing bada boom five minutes you're out of here he would talk to me for like 40 45 minutes he would even give me theological and philosophical homework to do one time one time he said one time he said I want you to come back with a robust with a robust next week with a robust canonical definition of Catholic marriage and what what is like an invalid versus a valid Catholic marriage and why in the world don't you let people divorce and remarry so like no pressure or anything no pressure no pressure so yeah that that's wonderful thank you for sharing so Dupree could you please give us like your sort of insider's uh, understanding and perspective of the value of what Bradley's talking about here with the judge playing an active role which is not always the case and that's fine. I know, like was said earlier by, by Lisa, you know, different AOT programs act differently. Uh, I was felt very lucky to be in a program where the judge played a very active role because for me, by the time I got to AOT, uh, by the time I was hospitalized, I had lost faith just in treatment providers. And, you know, objectively, perhaps I shouldn't have because they're doing their jobs. But after more than 10 years by that point of you know, not what diagnosis do I have? All of these meds that haven't worked, everything they've prescribed, all the counseling, all the therapy I've gone to, and nothing's gotten better and it's just getting worse. I absolutely just lost faith. But there was something that resonated with me of the judge not being there and not using his authority to punish or threaten because that really wasn't what the interaction was about, but using his authority to sort of hold the team accountable to each other and also hold me accountable to the team. There was just this added layer of accountability that resonated with me. And people might ask, well, if you were a psychotic, then how could something like that resonate with you? And I wish I had a great answer for you, but I don't, other than everything prior to Judge Kazin being involved with his team did not work well for me at all. Things just kept getting worse. So uh, what, what's commonly referred to in the AOT space is the black robe effect. I'm very interested to see uh, more stories like Bradley's, more stories like mine, where for some reason that we may not necessarily know for sure, the involvement of a judge really does help for folks like me, especially when our past up to that point has had us doubting or losing faith in the whole concept of the type of treatment providers that uh, are regularly engaging in folks with uh, SNY. So just, um, I'm just reminded back to, I look back to the, the AOT and me, um, presentation that was was well done. Um, meeting the client, the person where they are. Um, I heard one of the, the ALT and me uh, speakers saying that and you know how passionate the judge was about you know the people that come to in the court. So saying that to say Judge Mayer in our in our uh, case, you know met Bradley where he was. He knew what was important to Bradley, and he saw him as a person, and that's how he reached him. And that's also how I reached him. But also, you know, just treating it as, you know, these people, we're, we're all people, you know? And just because we have some, some type of ailment or whatever it is, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, 
marginalized or put down because of that. And so I think that was that's very important that the rope effect, but then also people see judges as, you know, this is an authority figure we want to, you know, we want to make happy. So Judge Mayer saw that in, in Bradley and made a connection and it took off. You know, and I just went on for the ride. Saying that to say, also it's very much a, a teamwork effort. So like I would take cues from Judge Mayer what to do, you know, um, and, and go from there. So it was, it was very much a collaboration. It wasn't, you know, the judge is the ultimate authority. And, you know, Bradley being, you know, the person coming into court being the one that's subservient, it was definitely a teamwork effort. We were all- It was like being it. coached. You know, like the coach is technically like the head of the team and he directs the efforts, but, not in like a tyrannical way, you know what I mean? I always tell people that I always go with the acronym PDI. I need to work on a better acronym, but but uh, PDI is what I've come up with where I say there, there's three primary ingredients, at least how in how I receive treatment AOT, and it's like personalism, dignity, and integrity. That they saw me like not as a quota or a number or a statistic. Like, and those things are good. Like research is good. We have an entire research you know, department obviously of TAC, but like, I wasn't just a number. I wasn't just filling a quota. I wasn't just, oh, I'm clocking in for the day and I have to deal with this numbskull, you know? <laughs> like, I, it was very much personalism. They saw me as a, it's a holistic approach. And then they treated me with full human respect and, and dignity as a person, and, and not only as a person, but as an individual. And they really respect me, treated with dignity, and that's the D. And then uh, the I is integrity, that throughout, at least in my experience, people often ask me, they're like, well, how do you think it should be implemented in other states and in other counties? I'm like, I don't live in other states and other counties. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so I, like, I, don't, I don't like to do, be a, someone that's like a, like a mono causation, like, oh, we can just blanket it absolutely everywhere. But I tell people if they stick with the personalism, dignity and integrity, you know, where it's a teamwork holding each other accountable, those three things, and they implement it with the culture and the background and the history of their states and counties in the same manner that they did in, in, in our county, then I think it can work wonders. Yeah, thank you for sharing. So, uh, you know, this PDI thing that you brought up, it's an excellent transition into talking about uh, comparing and contrasting your experience, and if you could share the story about, you know, punching the wall and what transpired from that and then comparing which that wall you, there we go so 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 they, they made you long story short they you punched a hole in a wall but it was sort of related to sm is this the homeless shelter incident this is gotcha. and then and then if you can compare sort of what it was like being on uh sure. uh, probation with p where there was no real pdi yeah i i i always do it um not not in a like sadistic way but like i i do it's it's a it's one of those stories where like you can look back and you're like wow that was crazy and it's kind of funny but also really bad but, but um in 2016 i was at college at magdalene college of the liberal arts which i can't speak highly enough it's such a great you know great books college i was there studying philosophy and humanities and it was february 2016 i went into a severe like sort of like a mixture of like severe manic and severe psychosis type of episode and uh and yeah like they i uh, the president of the college dr harn actually paid for my plane ticket home and i got a plane home uh which he never ever wanted me to pay back which is he never made me pay back which he was just so generous but but i i, I spiraled even after i got home and i got into a lot of arguments with my mom and i ended up being housed for a few weeks in uh in a Mansfield area a mental health agency homeless shelter, which not all counties have a mental health agency that has a homeless shelter as a part of their like complex as a part of their building, but this one does in Mansfield. Um, and the great thing is the county pays for you to be there as long as you need to until you get on your feet. So that's one good thing about Richland County, but uh, in, in Ohio. But but yeah, I was there for a few weeks, and I kept getting very very verbally and physically like death threats and constantly 
threatened by people. And I could tell some of these people were even more sick than I was. Like after I'd been there for about three or four days, they got me seeing a psychiatrist. They got me on a better mix of meds. Like it's just like a hospital visit. Like I kind of level out after a few days. But some of these folks were, were even far sicker than I was. Um, and like there was a guy that was so severely hallucinatory and schizophrenic that he was threatening to like slit my throat open actually. And, and eventually after weeks and weeks of like talking to the psychiatrist and talking to the, the attendants and people that are there in that shelter, um, it was not handled very well and th nothing was ever done to stop the threats. And eventually I, I got really angry and, and this is after I'd been there for about three or four weeks. So I had pretty much mental health lies leveled out, but you can only be like physically and verbally threatened constantly for so long. And I punched a hole in a wall. Um, and that's what landed me in about somewhere between like 13, 14 months of mental health probation court, which is very different from AO, like AOT wellness court, at least in my experience, it's very, very different. Um, during those 13, 14 months, I, I had, to, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy to think about cause I paid 969 in restitution for the wall. That's, that's $969. Dollars. So nine, yeah. 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 Cents. Okay. yeah. A lot of money. I, I paid $969 in restitution for the wall. It's funny. My brother, my brother, my old, one of my older brothers is actually like a really big into like contracting and construction. He's like, I could have fixed that for them for like 30 bucks. <laughs> 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 And, 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 and it's like my, my brother Nathan actually went before the court to actually do a lot of like the advocating for me as my big brother. Um, and when they told him that, he's like, you know, I can fix that for you. But, but yeah, um, but we, we, both him and my mother and I were told by the judge that he really didn't have any choice. I had to pay back that amount because it was technically like a state operated building. And that was the big reason why it cost that much. But, um, but yeah, during those 13, 14 months I had to, um, I had, I mean, I always take my meds ever since I was 11. I've never like purposefully not taken my meds. That's one, one positive thing in the whole story. But yeah, this was from like about March or April of 2016 until May of 2017 in the mental health probation court, I had to go to like anger management classes once, twice a week, schizophrenia classes twice a week. I had to go two, sometimes three times a week to the Mansfield Municipal Court building to get uh, randomly drug tested or randomly alcohol tested. Um, and on top of all that, uh, for a while I had to go every two weeks, but then they dialed it down to once a month. But every two weeks and then halfway through once a month I had to go before uh, the, the the judge, the mental health court judge, and I had to do all this at that time. At that time, I did not have a license or own my own car, but I had to make it to all these things, which were anywhere from like six to seven to sometimes twelve or thirteen miles away, and walking to them was like all uphill. But if I missed any of those things, I was immediately threatened with a possible 30 days or more in jail, in the county jail. So it sounds like what you're saying here, and what's being very clearly illustrated is pre-AOT, uh, there's the, you know, the SMI that's in your life. Uh, you're taking your meds. you had been taking them for a long time. But you end up being criminalized. And as a result of that, uh, facing probation, random drug tests, going to anger management classes, when what you really needed was the type of coordinated collaborative care provided by AOT. Yeah. So if you could fast forward to the time where AOT enters into your life, you know, you've got this time where I, I was so grateful to hear, like there was someone on your team who would take you to you need to go on errands, I'll take you to do this. So right right here, right? <laughs> it's debris. It's debris. So, so yeah, if you could sort of now sort of compare AOT against everything that we've heard up to this point of this uh, just yeah, terrible yeah. criminalization. Yeah, I there. went from I went from having to be randomly drug or alcohol tested like two or three times a week, even though I've literally never had a drug or alcohol problem, which I know AOT also has like things in place that can help you if you have struggled with that. But I personally have never had like a substance abuse or, or alcohol abuse problem personally. Um, but I still ha and I had to pay I had to pay them back like 175 bucks for all those tests, too. But yeah, I went from that and 
and anger management, schizophrenia classes, and and counseling classes, psychiatr psychiatric appointments, court appearances, twice you know, two every two weeks, uh, or either you get to all those things, you walk like all these miles uh, across the county to get to all these things, or you go to jail for thirty days, and then it was like day and night. It was like you know, it's like sw flipping on a switch in a dark room. It, it, it was it was a judge that would meet with me. It was at first once a week, then then every two weeks, then once a month. But, you know, Judge Mayor, it, it's just the fact of being treated more as the person and not as the illness, um, which I know that can sound like a cliche, but it's a real thing. You know, if someone, I mean, if, if you, and I've, I've experienced it before where sometimes I've become pretty guarded before I even tell someone that I am schizoaffective because sometimes I, I tell them that I'm schizoaffective and their face like curdles. It's like, really? But, um, but yeah, but Dupree, Dupree is my case manager, liaison person. Um, at least for the first year or so that I was in AOT, he was meeting with me once a week, every single week, and he would be like, oh, do you need to do a grocery run? Do you need like your lithium blood work checked? Do you need to get any to get to any appointments? Do you want to go to your local parish, your local church, and just talk about things? Do you need any sort like can I offer you any counseling today? Like, do you need to, to vent your emotions or vent your stressors to anybody? And it was, you know, it, it's like like I said, it's like day and night. It's like going from, well, you have to get to like these several things a week, every single week for 13, 14 months. And and you have to walk to all these things, which means you're pretty much permanently exhausted all the time. And it didn't depend what the weather was either. I had to find a way to get there. And, and it went from that or being threatened with jail to all of a sudden I have a case manager who cares, a counselor who cares, um, a psychiatrist who cares. Before I entered AOT, before I was given like the psychiatrist that they assigned to me after being put in AOT, after entering AOT, the, counselor, the psychiatrist I had I had actually been Skyping for like four months in a row because they were like in Florida, I guess. And that's not like me like trying to down on psychiatrists. I love the psychiatric profession. Um, it's just that I was given a whole team that was like a cohesive unit and all they cared about was like what was best for me, you know, not what was best for a policy or an initiative or, or anything else. It was like, uh, it was about me which I was not used to. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm the youngest of five kids. So it's like you raise your voice and you fight and you get, you get what you need to get and you get all the hand-me-downs, but then all of a sudden it's like all about me. And I was like, this feels nice. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I'm, I'm looking at time. I really want to open up for Q&A here in about five, six minutes because I can imagine that uh, some of you may have questions for either of these gentlemen up here. But I'd like to ask uh, one, one more question, starting with you, Dupree. Uh, you know, it, it, it's fair to bring up the point, even though I don't agree with it, opposition to AOT exists. I think as we heard from questions in the audience earlier, and as some folks may know, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what AOT is, what it isn't, and uh, it's important to address that with respectful dialogue, respectful discourse, so that way, you know, education can happen, because there's going to continue to be misunderstandings if folks aren't educated about what it is. If you could have a conversation with just any general opposition to AOT, what is it that you would want them to know to help them understand uh, just the, the magic of what it can do when, when utilized appropriately? Well, I don't have like an answer or magic elixir or whatever. Mm. But what I will say is so, you know, I'm not a licensed therapist, but I am a human listener you know, that's an invested listener. So I will listen to where Bradley was coming from. Um, but saying all that to say, so I hope this answers your question. Uh, but I'm very taken aback to when I listen to Bradley's story through the mental health court, mental court and mental health court. I've never been involved in that. And I'm not saying anything bad about that. I don't, I don't know, I can't speak to that because I'm not involved in that. I am involved in AOT. So listening to Bradley's story about how he had to walk, you know, miles and miles, and they expected him to be there. And if he didn't, he was violated on, you know, well, you didn't show up, let's drug screen you real quick or whatever, because you didn't walk several miles or whatever. Um, the difference between that and AOT is, 
I would coordinate with Bradley Duke or whoever the person is. Do you need a ride, you know, to get to court? You know, then if they set up and we arrange a ride and they're not there, then they're held to account. Not, oh, well, you gotta walk and find your own way. You know, so that's the difference, you know, between those two programs. So I kind of hope that answers your question because I don't have a canned answer. I just have an experienced answer. That's what we were looking for. So, that's why you're here. Right. So that's that's my answer to that. You know, just the human being aspect of the AOT, meeting people again to the uh, AOT because, because he's a human being, because he needs a voice, you know, because he needs someone to advocate for them. Sometimes uh, they need somebody to fight for them. Sometimes they need somebody to, to fight against them, you know, when you know, when things are going bad or whatever. So, um, so that's, that's, that's why, just to advocate for the human being so that they can be where they wanna be. Yeah. Thank you, Dupree. And uh, Bradley, if, if you can let other folks know why, but not necessarily why shouldn't you oppose AOT, but help them understand why opposition to it doesn't make sense. The, the number one thing I like to tell people and this is this is very very much like a like a a triggery type of thing that you can say but the phrase court order is not always a bad phrase it like the words court order or court mandated can be a good thing if there's a like i said a cohesive team the judge cares they they're compassionate people um if they're like true like vocationists and they're they're passionate about their calling um, cause I gotta tell you in 2019, when I had a very, like what I call my super, super symptomatic season, uh, I went, I had to go before a magistrate and they had me like in kind of like the type of jumpsuit cause they were going to take me to the Maslin state hospital for a week or two just to level me out. But they, they tried to explain AOT, but it just sounded like a repeat of mental health court, like probation court. And I was in front of a magistrate and I was like, oh crap. <laughs> but, 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 and, and Dupree will tell you, it, it took me like about a month or two, maybe even three months of being in AOT to actually warm up. It took me a little while to warm up to him and, and get in a good flow with him and the judge because I had just been so conditioned my whole life to the phrase court order being nothing but a bad thing. I'm speechless after that. I'm like, what do I say that sounds good? Nothing. I can't possibly top that. Um, uh, thank you so much, Debrie. Thank you so much, Bradley. I would love to open up for Q&A right now if anyone happens to have any questions. I, I see hands going up. There... I'm going to pass back. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Amy. It looks like we're passing out microphones. Wonderful. Would we like to start back there with you, Amy, who you handed the mic to? Hi, I'm Kadria Corley. I work for the court and the AOT that Bradley is speaking on. And at the time we did his hearing, we went to the hospital and we were just right outside the area that he was on. He couldn't even come to the room for our hearing is how sick he was. He said, just, I'll go along with whatever you do. I'm okay with that. So from him to go to that, to where he is now, is just amazing and I'm so proud of him. He's like our poster child for AOT. Yeah. And I'm so yeah. proud of him. <laughs> That's all for you, man. That's all for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Betsy. Please go ahead. Apologize for your experience in a mental health court. I'm a liaison for a mental health court. And we do not run like that. So all of you, just to, you know, every mental health courts run a little differently, but we try to do a lot of what it sounds like your AOT program did. So I apologize for your experience. That really stuck to me because we try really hard to work with our people and get them in a better place. So hopefully you guys work with any other mental health courts. Hopefully that won't be your experience, <laughs> but we're not all the same. <laughs> I, I actually appreciate that a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Over. Okay. Question for Dupree, how, how big was your caseload? Um, well, my caseload, I'm sorry, I don't, 
Over here. Over here to the left. Okay. So um, my caseload for AOT at the time when I worked with, with Bradley was, I think I had like six AOT clients. Um, but in, in addition to that, then I had like my case management through the agency catalyst that I worked for. I had like, I think it was like 40 to 40 some clients at the time. So it kind of fluctuates. But I wear, I wear two different hats. I'm the liaison uh, for Richland County Court, but then I'm also a case manager for the agency that I work for. Over to the right. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your story and your experience. Um, it's really heartwarming and very appreciated. I think one of the things that I've appreciated most about working with AOT is a lot of what you guys said. It's that collaboration. It's the judge's role and how critical it can be. Dupree, your role and how critical it can be. I think that it is that, you know, I think at one point, Eric, you said, I'm not even sure why. And I think, honestly, what I've seen is that for our individuals that come in, our members that come in that, that are experiencing um, AOT, it's that ability to kind of restore hope that someone of that authority is going to invest in me, right? And that it's a moment when, you know, Dupree takes the time to listen and to hear and invest in me as a person. That makes it so critical. It makes it work. And I think that's so, you know, so thank you to all of the judges. I know we've worked with Judge Anderson. You're amazing. Um, and all of the judges that, that do take the time and energy to really invest in these folks because I think their experience I'm sorry, I'm so, I sh I'm so I'm shaking. Um, but th their experience has just not been what you want it to be, right? And it's so heartwarming to go into that courtroom and see somebody really invest in care and see you get to change your life. Um, so it's really inspiring to hear your story. Thank and you. I think lastly, what I would say is um, one of the things that you, when you said that, um, you weren't sure why, and I think it really is that when you're sitting there, you want to be seen. When you're in psychosis, you want to be seen as human, right? You don't want to be seen as your diagnosis. You don't want to be seen as your symptoms. And that's what AOT allows you the opportunity to have, is to be seen for who you are. So thank you again for your, for your time today. Bradley, what is schizophrenia class and what did you learn in it? Things that I knew since I was 11 years old. <laughs> and for everybody apologizing for things, the great thing about being schizophrenic is I can apologize to myself. Mm, there you go, yeah. Horrible joke, horrible joke. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was like, I'm obviously like, we often talk about like my tripod of passions of like theology, philosophy, history. I, I, when I get diagnosed with something, so when I was 11 all the way to 26, I was constantly reading articles and reading stats and studies and things about like, this is the regions of the brain that do this and here's the chemicals that might be going wrong and here's what these symptoms mean. And I would literally like read the packets that came with my medications. They weren't teaching me anything that I didn't already know. Um, anger management, I mean, I, I learned some good, some good helpful tips from anger management. That was the one really, really positive thing about mental health probation court was that after a year or so of anger management classes, uh, they did teach me a lot of useful things for like if I'm in the middle of getting manic. So that, that was nice. But yeah, when it came to the schizophrenia and mental illness type classes, it was like, it was always like a, a 20 or 21 like undergrad person that was like trying to like gain credit from teaching these classes. <laughs> and like, don't get me wrong, like I love undergrads, they're great people. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying though, it's like, can we at least get like a, a licensed person in here? But, but, <laughs> but yeah, like that really is the short responses that like basically things that I had already known since I was 11 years old. Over here, Eric. 
Hi, I have a question for Bradley. Bradley, I work on the assisted outpatient treatment team, um, and we do a lot of work with families. And I was wondering if you could speak on, has there been any effect with your relationships with your siblings and your parents? <laughs> and did the AOT team, were they involved in, uh, in AOT with you when you were? Um, well, my, my siblings, uh, the past, you know, three or four years have lived mostly uh, in Richland County, where I live, in, in, or at least somewhere in Ohio. My sister lives in Westerville. But, um, but actually, ever since I got, like, the firm stabilized diagnosis of schizoaffective, which I always tell, I mean, this is an oversimplification, but I tell people being schizoaffective means that you have, like, a hodgepodge stew mix of both bipolar and schizophrenia. Uh, because that's the easiest way to explain it to people. Um, but it, it's, it's affected how uh, I treat my siblings, because um, when people treat you in a holistic approach and with compassion and gentleness and patience and prudence and integrity and all those other uh, platitudes, um, <laughs> my, uh, when people treat you as a, a, the whole person, you tend to treat your whole family as the whole person. But I will say... Um, Though I talk a lot about my siblings and how I'm involved in their lives and how I'm involved in the lives of, of in the life of my mother and my grandmother and such, um, my AOT team was more focused on on me. They didn't really get uh, super involved in my family. I mean, they taught me a lot of things of like to take home to help how my my family understands me and how they interact with me and how to de-escalate me if I'm like. Uh, depressed or manic. But by the way, um, I have not had any suicidal ideations at all that I've like, I mean, you can have an intrusive thought, like a crazy thought, like, what if I jump off this ledge? But that's just an intrusive psychological thought. But like, I've never actually succumbed to any sort of suicidal, suicidal ideation since, uh, since 2011. And that was because, yeah. And and that, and that was because uh, in the spring semester of my junior year of high school, I made a much, much better group of friends. Um, I often tell people, people often think that you have to like start a foundation or pass a bill or vote for this person or start this grassroots movement. And those are all good things. But I tell people sometimes it's as simple as sharing your chocolate milk or sharing your apple at lunch because your friend can't afford lunch. If you do that, you are a mental health advocate. Hi there, this is Leslie Carpenter, and I want to ask this question of Bradley and Eric. We have a lot of people who in the country advocate fiercely against AOT, disability rights groups, etc. I know how it makes me feel as a mom. I really want to know how it makes you two feel to have to face people who are advocating so fiercely against getting you treatment when you really needed it. Um, well, I, I often tell people, like I said before, I know that if the manner and the integrity and the, the, the teamwork, if it's implemented culturally in other places, it can work. But I also often tell people, for, for myself, the proof is in the pudding that it worked for me, but there's a lot of different types of pudding. Hmm. So like, I don't, <laughs> I mean, there really are. I've, I've had a lot of them, but, but, <laughs> but, but like, like I can, I don't, I, I, I'm gonna say what, what one of my favorite authors, uh, John Green has often said, sometimes it's hard to judge someone because they have a foreign code of conscience. Like their conscience and what they've experienced and what they've gone through is maybe why they oppose this, but I can only speak for myself. And for, for this pudding, it's pretty tasty because it worked pretty well. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, just very quickly, because uh, I know that you asked me as well. Uh, yeah, I, I share the sentiment that Bradley just said. And, and uh, you know, for folks, who have never experienced something on the SMI side of things, um, 
I, I can, you know, kind of play devil's advocate and see where they're coming from. Because if you've never seen psychosis or experienced it firsthand or SMI, you know, I get the knee-jerk reaction to, well, this seems like a violation of liberties or a violation of rights because I would never want this. Great, you would never want that. You would never need it, right? And then secondly, when folks are like, well, I hear AOT sometimes being mischaracterized. It's forced treatment or it's forced care. And uh, it, it's not forced. And, and something I often tell people is the most forceful thing that I've ever experienced is not AOT. Uh, it's it's uh, not even being jailed for a psychosis when, when I had that. It is my own untreated and undertreated SMI uh, holding my mind hostage. And AOT is what helped free me from that. So for someone who's never been in the depths of that or experienced the abyss of what Bradley's been through, some of the things I've been through, uh, it, it very easily in their minds it logically does not make sense to say a judge doesn't need to be involved go see a counselor and if you don't want to see a counselor that's your choice well if anyone has ever seen someone in the depths of smi that's untreated or undertreated how much of what i do what bradley did prior to prior to effective treatment would you actually fairly characterize as choice and freedom it it, it didn't exist prior to it an aot is the one thing that was introduced into my life that after more than a decade of failures of uh, you know, uh, medicinal trial and error not working from various psychiatrists, moving from one psychiatrist to another, being arrested, my parents trying to get me up. These stories that all of you out here are very familiar with in one way or another. How is that freedom and choice? If you've actually seen it, you know that it's not. And I can tell you in be, from being in Judge Kazin's program, I was never threatened with punishment. And I, I, you know, I don't know that anyone else in AOT was either. The whole reason we were there was, uh, as I've heard Brian say, like it, it, the judges aren't there wagging their fingers at people, and it, that isn't the case. We're there, the treatment team is there, I'm there as an AOT participant, Bradley's there as an AOT participant, to collaborate towards the common goal of achieving some sort of health and symptom management so that we can live our lives with freedom and choice. And I know that was a big old word salad, but I hope it made sense to some degree. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Cindy Schwartz. I'm from South Florida. I want to thank you for sharing your experience and providing the hope that it takes for all of us to move forward and, and making sure that recovery is real. It's real for you and, and you, Bradley, and also for you, Dupree, because there are so many unsung heroes in this process. It's not just the judge, it's not just the participant, it's the case managers, it's the people in the court, it's the public defenders and the state attorneys. There are so many people that, are, that need to connect the dots for our communities to move forward towards success and building a full continuum of care. And, um, and I just want to say thank you to everybody in the room, the police officers that are here that also are involved, because it takes everyone to make this work. So thank you very much for sharing, and thank you to everyone in the room that's here today that really wants to do the right thing. Thank you. So I have a quick question, I hope as a practical question. Uh, what, any advice for a respondent whose religious beliefs prevent them from wanting to take medications, i.e. it's a worldly thing, not a godly thing? And in particular, I have a client right now who as a Buddhist um, and believes that putting chemicals in, that the Buddhist uh, religion doesn't allow chemicals to be put in the body because that would stifle nirvana. Um, any advice on how to handle a case like that? Dharma is a fickle thing. <laughs> That's the Dhammapada speaking. But uh, <laughs> Dupree, have you seen anything like that in part part of your case management? Um, if you, in general, if someone, I mean, this this client's right. I mean, if they mm -hmm. if they choose not to 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 medicate, and you know, they have the right to to you know, not take medication. Um, it's not it's not really you know my. It's not really my place to make someone take anything. I can strongly encourage them, like, hey, man, I, I understand that, that that's your, your belief. Uh, but, you know, 
this is a suggestion, but then it's up to them to do it, you know. So I have to meet them where they are and, and, and work with them as they, you know, choose to do what they, what they do. Thanks, Sabrina. Thank you, Janet. I wish I had a good response for it. I, I don't. Um, I, I think I'm confident that I am not the right person to ask you about this, but I would similarly echo uh, what Dupree said and, and strongly encourage people. But, you know, religious and spiritual convictions are very, very strong in some in folks, and they have the right to that. Um, I, I think there's always a good conversation to be had, though. Uh, if, if an individual can have a respectful conversation with someone like the priest, someone on their treatment team, someone in a peer context, as would be the case with Bradley, or I'd help explain like what life can feel and look like after that. Um, that's the best, I think that's the best we can do. Uh, there, there, I, I am not a legal mind in here. I don't know if there's legal statutes in place to force people to take meds against spiritual, against spiritual or religious convictions. I would recommend talking to uh, legal minds about that. Uh, but from just a moral perspective, I think it's always a good idea to have a conversation, even if it's a tough one. We, we can't guarantee what the outcome will be, but at least have the tough conversation. And from a from a Catholic perspective, I can only, like you said, I, we, can, we can only speak from our own perspective. From a Catholic perspective, I always recommend to people the, the very in-depth encyclical written by uh, John Paul II called uh, Fetus et Ratio. It's the cooperation between faith and reason. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. My name is Melinda. I'm with uh, Janet's New Orleans AOT group. I am both a family member and a provider, and like many, one because of the other. Um, but what you all spoke about kind of brought me full circle. I remember why I became one because of the other when I was a very little girl watching my parents with my older brother at this. We lived outside of Philadelphia, and there's this wonderful learning center uh, where they had a multidisciplinary team. And this was in the early 70s, so that was a little unheard of. Um, but they wouldn't care coordinate. And I remember hearing the social worker tell my parents one thing, and then the psychiatrist tell them another, and then the psychologist tell them another. And the social worker had a really good point. And when my parents tried to repeat it to the psychologist or the psychiatrist, they were like, well, that's sweet what the social worker says. Yeah, and they wouldn't care coordinate with each other. Um, so that's been a passion of mine since then. Um, so I'm nationally certified counselor, duly licensed in Louisiana as a licensed professional counselor and a licensed marriage and family therapist. And my older sibling has paranoid schizophrenia, has been um, non-compliant with treatment for quite a long time. Um, so my question is, when you all were talking about medications being changed and who put you on what and not knowing which one was the right one and the diagnosis changing. So I've seen those things and care coordination is very important to me as a provider so much so that in 25 years of practice, I've gone into managed care. I've done quality improvement, care advocacy and case management for Fortune 500 insurers, insurance companies across the country. Um, so th what I'm wondering is what is happening and Dupree, is that your role? Um, as a case manager to make sure that me as the therapist is care coordinating with the psychologist who's care coordinating with the psychiatrist. Are we getting their medical history? Are we getting their clinical records so we don't make them go through the same medication changes that they've already gone through? Are we looking at what diagnoses have already been ruled out? Are we looking at what tests they've already been given? Are we looking at their history and collaborating with each other? How are we making that happen in our best practice AOTs? Um, so to answer that question, simply yes, they they do all all of that. Um, you know, their medical records passed. All of that stuff is taken into account. But one thing I do like about AOT in, in particular is it holds people to account. So like, it will hold me to account, but then it'll hold the doctor to account and the therapist to account and the case manager to account of. What is the person taking? How often are they seeing the doctor? Um, you know, when are they scheduled for their next appointments? Um, if something's changed, why? I have to write a report as to, you know, the doctor said they changed this because of X, Y, Z. Um, my relationship with that person would be, hey man, how you doing on your, you know, with this new medication that the doctor provided? Oh, well, it made me feel this way. Well, did you talk to the doctor about it? Yeah, and then they change it. Then I report that to the court. And then, you know, there's, so it, it holds everybody to account, makes everything transparent to why things are being done. So if there's, 
there shouldn't be this yo-yo, or if there is a yo-yo, then we, you know, work to stabilize that. The providers are working with each other. Yes. And, and that's, at least, you know, again, I'm hearing all this stuff about puddings and all this stuff like that. So, you know, I can't speak to, to what happens in other places. And, you know, I heard the lady say this didn't, doesn't happen in her mental health court, and that's great. But for Richland County, this happens. Um, we report that, and then there's, so there's a record of what goes on and why things are changed. And it's so frustrating for the families and the patients, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I find the importance of diagnosis is just to label somebody who's supposed to be driving treatment. But if you don't have the appropriate diagnosis, how can we know what the appropriate medication is? So I think it's awesome that you're pulling it all together. Thank you. So this is a, just a quick question uh, for all three of you all. Um, we know there's a, a great debate between people who believe AOT is coercive and treated uh, treatment, you're forcing people into treatment. And there's a little bit of the sugar coating, which is, oh, it's all love, ra doze, ra uh, daisies and roses. Um, did it have an effect on all any of you that not only did we hold the providers accountable, uh, the, the, the doctors accountable, the system accountable, but it's not all sugar coated because if in fact you were to deteriorate, we have a mechanism to quickly get you to the treatment you need inpatient if we had to. So it's, it's, we don't have that ability to throw you in jail, nor do we want you, and we don't threaten you with it. But what was the effect of knowing, either good or bad, that if you deteriorated, we were there to get you the treatment quickly instead of finding you six months under a bridge, uh, yelling at the sky kind of thing? Or walking on I-71 toward Cleveland, thinking that you're meeting up with Billy Graham. That was a real delusion I had. Um, for. For me, uh, first, for one second, I want to say some, something on what she said, um, is that uh, they actually looked back with my, all of my psychiatric diagnoses and records when I entered AOT. My psychiatrist went all the way back to when I was 11, and I was first hospitalized at Akron Children's Hospital, and that's how she came up with the actual firm diagnosis of schizoaffective. So you, uh, you, you need... Uh, you need someone to be able to uh, to actually review your entire history. And you need someone to care enough to, to, to do that work. Um, but yeah, um, can you restate the end of your question again? It's just real quick, there's also another side to it, and that is you knew that if you deteriorated or if somebody oh, sure. did deteriorate, we were there also to keep you what's called on the radar and get yeah. you to where you needed to be. Yeah, when I entered AOT, I could call my psychiatrist and schedule an emergency meeting if I had to, you know, discuss my meds and I could be in with the psychiatrist like within within three days. Um, yeah. And uh, and or I could call Dupree or text Dupree and see if, if I could meet up with him and see where we could go from there. Um, I will say what made me feel very, very coerced is what happened immediately after, or, or I mean, immediately before I entered AOT, because when I went before the magistrate and they signed the pa we signed the papers for AOT, but the thing that immediately happened before I ever went in front of Judge Mayer was they put me in like the actual like inmate like fetters, the the bonds and chains and stuff, and they had me in the jumpsuit. And you know, they have the stereotypical county cop that's like, we are gonna have any trouble from you, boy? But, but like, but like, but um, and I'm like, no, <laughs> I haven't punched a wall in like 18 months, I promise. <laughs> but, 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 you know, it, it goes from literally being treated in a way where it's like, they think you're so dangerous that you have to be put in chains and put in a cop car to like, yeah, like they, they don't, it, AOT is, is structured so that you don't deteriorate. You have your case manager that you can text or call day or night. You can schedule an emergency, like within the next 72 hours, you can get in with your psychiatrist, you can get in with your, your counseling psychologist, you can, um, I mean, you can even schedule, like if you need to like get a hold of the judge, they have ways that you can get a hold of the judge so that the judge can change something having to do with your treatment. Yeah, it, it, like, like I said before, it's like day and night. Is it, they get it. Judge Case, and I know you asked the three of us, I'll very quickly say, it's not all, it wasn't all sunshine and butterflies. You know you were the judge overseeing when I was in it. But uh, I, I do want to bring this up. So when I was deteriorating, um, 
And I was on an AOT order. It was just my meds stopped working because my brain chemistry changed, so those meds weren't working anymore. I was able to swiftly be brought back into the hospital. Uh, and for all of you parents and caregivers out there who know that I was brought into a hospital nearly immediately because I was known and that I was decompensating, uh, imagine being able over a few short years being able to get a bed in a hospital exactly when I needed it because I was known to the system and then they could coordinate with the hospital to bring me back in and get stabilized. There are families out there waiting years to get their loved ones beds. So the fact that an AOT treatment team can help prioritize an individual, get them stabilized inpatient care if needed, yeah, that's there. I needed it, it worked, and uh, here I am. So uh, I know we're running low on time. I see nods, I yeah. see time. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Eric. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Okay, and, and I, I have a question for Bradley, but just want to make a quick comment before I get to that uh, in response to uh, the question that Janet asked about someone whose religious beliefs are preventing them from uh, engaging with medication. Because I actually have a pretty good thought about that. It might be of, of interest to someone else who encounters that situation. Unless the person is a member of a, like a real fringe religion that truly is anti-medication or anti-psychiatry, um, I would think there would be great opportunities to engage with members of that religion or leaders within that religion that you could bring into the picture that would have a lot more credibility with that person than you would, right? So if you know, you're talking about a Buddhist, I mean, I would reach out to Buddhist temples in your community and maybe even get a Buddhist priest who will have a theological discussion with, with your client and give them some a different perspective on why it's perfectly consistent with the religion to take medication. Um, but my question for Bradley, um, I don't think you've talked much about what you have in mind for your future. You're obviously an, a, just a, such an inspirational person with so much to offer. And I think you did mention that you had left school at one point, and I'm just wondering, you know, it, I, maybe you've already completed education since then, but I'm wondering what uh, kind of goals and aspirations you have and where you go from here. Well, uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Well, um, at one point, I actually did try to enter seminary. Um, I was told that to be a diocesan parish priest, when it comes to like things like insurance and financial responsibility and stuff, it might not be the best route. Uh, I was told that by the vocation director for the Diocese of Toledo. Um, but he also told me that maybe I should look into being a monk, like a Catholic monk actually. So I've been thinking, I've been ruminating on that. Um, I've been doing a lot of journaling. I'm thinking about maybe seeing if I can get like some articles that I write published when it comes to things like the theology and philosophy and history and cinema and how they all interact with one another. Um, I'm currently very much lobbying on the internet for Ridley Scott to make an accurate historical movie. And we'll see how that pans out. Um, <laughs> um, Cause all of his historical movies are really, really out there and really, really wrong. But, um, but I, I basically, I do a lot of reading I do a lot of praying. Um, I, I currently am actually the, the parish librarian for my entire church. So I actually organize their entire theology and philosophy library. And before anything gets put into the library, it has to go through me. Uh, so, so yeah, to make sure it's like kind of up to, up to snuff. But, um, but I don't have any immediate plans. Um, I have been, been encouraged by some people to try and go back to school. Um, but I actually do want to maybe get a couple more years of solid mental balance health sure. under my belt before going back before thinking of going back to college but uh but yeah but basically i'm just journaling a lot reading a lot and i'm volunteering in the community and actually uh one thing i do know is that uh probably all the way until the day that i die i will keep doing cit training for like for uh, ohio yeah that's what i was saying Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you, Dupree. Again, thank you to all of you. Thank you to Treatment Advocacy Center. I can tell you both of these gentlemen here have kindly agreed. If you have questions, you want to get a hold of them, and we weren't able to get to your question now, or you come up with a question at a later time, if you reach out to Treatment Advocacy Center, uh, both of them here have graciously said that they'd be able to do that. And if you could, would you please just join me in giving another round of thunderous applause to them? Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We are tight on time, and it looks like we ran over. But thank you all for being patient with us. Appreciate y'all. Thanks, man.